college. So I think it's kind of important to do Admiralty on work in coastal Georgia. And I've always found it kind of interesting. So yeah, definitely. Awesome. How about yourself, Forrest? Uh, I got assigned a manuscript to edit and it was all about admiralty or admiralty and I thought it was interesting. So I decided to take the course. Awesome. What was the manuscript about? Oh gosh, just a bunch of different uh, admiralty changes in the law from like the past year, just certain cases. Oh, very cool. Um, awesome. Well, um, so I know today's reading was quite a lot. Um, so, so, and quite, you know, a lot of it is really substantive discussing a lot of like past historical precedent, um, in maritime law. So, you know, we'll try to get through it, um, as best as possible. Uh, so, um, you know, if y'all don't understand a concept or, you know, need to, we need to, you know, spend some extra time on something, you know, let's not worry to like do that and just spend the extra time on it. Um, so, um, I don't, uh, you know, unfortunately I didn't prepare, uh, you know, a fun presentation like Colin usually does for his. Um, so what I'll do, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and jump straight into a case. So the, I guess the fun fact for the evening is going to be that tomorrow is the 100th anniversary of the Jones Act, which I'm sure from discussing semen cases and whatnot, you know, plays a big role um, in the maritime world. Um, so with that being said, um, let's start with, uh, Dutra v. Batterton. Um, Forrest, you had that case. Am I, is that correct? I think, I think I had that, that one. Was, yeah. um, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. If you want to take it away and just start off with the facts of the case. Okay. Um, so an employee was injured um, while offloading, I think, a generator um, from a boat to a barge, and he filed a suit against, um, I guess it was Dutry Group, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, for negligence and... Um, Sorry, my notes are all over the place. Um, yeah. So he filed for negligence, but he had two claims there. So what's the what what was what's the distinction between negligence and the maritime law? It wasn't just negligence that I was suing for, was it? Um, no, he was what punitive damages, right? So punitive and damages. Was was a part of it. Um, sorry, my notes. I normally have another computer. I'm not home, so I'm having to get used to this. Um, okay. I'm sorry. I read you the wrong case. I read you Barre. Barre. I'm so uh, sorry. Barre. Okay. Okay. That's why I was confused. <laughs> yeah, there was a, yeah, there was a, because oh. I had both of the B's. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, Bar Barrington was a deck on vessel owned and operated by the Dutch Tree Group. Um, and while he was working on the vessel, a hatch cover blew open and he crushed his hand. Um, so he... Uh, Sorry, I got all. So who was the? So who was he? So as a Jones Act seaman, who is who was he able to sue? Um, he was suing Dutchery, right? Mm-hmm. And he, they were arguing that. So Dutchery moved to strike because they were arguing. Okay, sorry, I found it. So he sued them for negligence, unseaworthiness, maintenance, and cure in unearned wages. And then Dutry moved to strike um, Batterson's claim because they said 
stated that unseaworthiness wasn't available um, for punitive damages, I believe, right? Correct. And so, um, and so were punitive damages available for his Jones Act claim? Um, I believe so. So, um, so as you said, you know, correctly, so basically he sued for under the Jones Act for negligence. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, as a Jones Act seaman, he sued for um, unseaworthiness for the vessel. Um, and, you know, he also sued for those unearned wages, which really isn't in play here. Um, so for his unseaworthiness action, have y'all, y'all covered that? Is that correct? Or for um, personal injuries? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, so unseaworthiness and um, Jones Act negligence are two different causes of action. Okay. Um, and can you tell me what the distinction between the two just based off of reading the opinion? Um, see, I found it a little confusing, but, um, okay, so, so seaman, seaman, they, is it seeming that they can duplicate in his recovery by collecting? See, I was confused between the two because I between, had issues. Between Jones Act negligence and unseaworthiness? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's no problem. Uh, so basically, unseaworthiness and Jones Act negligence are two distinct causes of action available to seamen. So under the Jones Act, um, which was, again, that bill that was passed by Congress um, back in 1920, so 100 years ago, essentially it gave the right to um, American seamen to sue their owners for negligence, because before that, they didn't have that, the right to do so under the general maritime law. Um, however, before that, um, they also they had, had, did have a distinct cause of action called unseaworthiness, but unseaworthiness isn't an action that's, that's based in negligence. It's similar, but it's, it's not quite the same. Um, and so uh, essentially um, the Jones Act um, is incorporated a lot of what is known as FILA, which is a separate statutory regime that was given to railroad workers um, and it actually has a prohibition against punitive damages. Um, so what the Supreme Court has interpreted post, you know, after enacting the Jones Act and Congress gave this remedy to seamen was that Jones Act, for Jones Act negligence, seamen didn't have a punitive damages claim available because they were interpreting, you know, very similar to, to these other statutory regimes that Congress based it off of. Um, but um, and I guess here, so the issue is, was that prohibition against punitive damages under the Jones Act negligence cause of action also prohibited under the unseaworthiness cause of action was the, was the main issue of the case. Um, and so based on your reading of it, did you, Kind of, did you pick up any any re, any arguments on why they thought that you know that prohibition against punitive damages for Jones Act negligence should also apply to unseaworthiness? Um, I believe it was this case that talked about how. Um, Was this the case that they were talking about? I miss kind of like double dipping in a way and. Mm -hmm. I think you I might mean, be talking about Miles. Mm -hmm. And also they talked about how I believe in the past that 
overwhelmingly there wasn't historically punitive damages and kind of there was an argument that it should continue and we should follow historical precedents that there should not be punitive damages. Um, let's see. And then there's argument about policy grounds for allowing punitive damages. Um, So that that's correct. So going to your to your first point, um, historically the court does argue that punitive damages were never really awarded in unseaworthiness actions, even before passage of the Jones Act, um, and they use that reasoning to say, well, if it wasn't available before you know, why should we create this novel remedy for it now? Why, you know, why should we apply it to? But, you know, as you're kind of hinting at getting to your second reasons, you know, for the policies in favor, um, what did you think about, they mentioned a case called Townsend in which punitive damages were available um, for, for another type of action for it. Um, what do you think about for its for maintenance and cure essentially is the this cause of action. What do you think about that? Um I know okay, Townsend, I'm not sure about Townsend in particular, but um I know the case in the book was talking about how necessarily that by not having punitive damages it could cause the master of the ship to be less careful when um, operating the ship and maybe go in rough for waters, whatever. And that was kind of an argument for punitive damages because it made sure that the master of the ship was held responsible for their actions and not putting crew in danger. Um, but, okay, let's see. And that's, and that is um, partly correct. So punitives were, you know, are in order, you know, I'm not sure if y'all have discussed um, the Exxon case in which, you know, said that punitive damage, you know, kind of talked about the ratio of punitive damages um, available in, in maritime cases. Uh, but, you know, essentially punitives are to deter action, you know, um, you know, willful, you know, wanton action by, you know, the tortfeasor essentially. So in this case, you know, the, the employer or the vessel owner. Um, but here in, in Batterton, one of the big issues was essentially, so seamen have what's called a trilogy of actions. And this is kind of goes back to what we said at the beginning, you know, they have Jones Act negligence, which Congress gave them in 1920. They have the unseaworthiness cause of action, which has, you know, it evolved into essentially strict liability cause of action. The, the vessel owner himself, you know, must provide a seaworthy vessel, you know, in which, you know, seamen can work on. And that actually extends, you know, when you think of seaworthiness, it's not just, you know, does the ship float, you know, making sure all the parts work correctly, that they have a, you know, uh, see where they work, you know, work environment. Um, this could also extend to crew. You know, if you hire people who are unqualified for it, that, that can make the vessel unseaworthy, um, et cetera. And then their third uh, cause of action is called maintenance and cure. Um, and maintenance and cure really isn't a, isn't, isn't negligence. It isn't a negligence cause of action. It's a quasi contractual. So essentially ship owners are required to provide maintenance. So a daily living rate and then cure, you know, up to, you know, uh, basically providing for their, uh, the welfare of their seamen while they're injured or sick, et cetera, um, up to a certain point. Um, especially, you know, back in, you know, pre 20th, especially pre 20th century and early 20th century, you know, it's not like a seaman could just hop on a flight back to his home country. You know, if he was, he could be stranded in a port somewhere where he didn't know anyone, couldn't receive any care, couldn't get any care, um, you know, didn't speak the language, et cetera. So it was a very, you know, kind of different, harsher world um, for them. And so that's why they had that, you know, maintenance and cure remedy so that, you know, if a seaman got 
stranded, you know, injured or sick during the middle of the voyage, and he had to get left off the ship, that the ship owner was obligated to basically provide for him while, you know, he was recovering wherever he was. Um, and so the Supreme Court, in a case um, called Townsend, essentially allowed, you know, the same issue came up, was punitive damages available to this cause of action by seamen or for seamen? And uh, the Supreme Court ended up saying, yes, punitive damages are available when a, when an, you know, uh, employer, seaman, you know, denies them maintenance and cure. I um, mean, again, you know, it has to be willful and wanton, et cetera. Um, and so by allowing punitive damages for that claim, part of the Supreme Court's reasoning in Townsend was that punitive damages was available because maintenance and cure was an ancient remedy, so pre-Jones Act remedy available to them, and that, you know, not often, but sometimes, you know, and sometimes punitive damages would be awarded to seamen prior to the passage of the Jones Act. Um, and so, because the maintenance and cure was a general maritime law remedy, and punitive damages as a remedy was available, the Supreme Court reasoned that, you know, it could be, it's still available now even in light of some more recent precedent, which is in miles that said otherwise. Now, the same, it, the reason this came up in unseaworthiness is because unseaworthiness itself is not a statutory remedy for seamen. It's a general maritime law remedy. And so the argument essentially was, you know, if you're gonna give punitive damages and other general maritime law remedies, why shouldn't it be available in this one for unseaworthiness? And so, but the court said no here. Um, and as you pointed out earlier, essentially, you know, part of their reasoning was the Jones Act. They said, you know, the Jones Act doesn't allow punitive damages in this case, and that's a statutory remedy. Congress has spoken. But I mean, did you find it odd that, you know, they would say that Congress has spoken, but they haven't spoken directly on unseaworthiness. They've only spoken on Jones Act negligence. Yeah, that was one thing I was getting them mixed up as I was reading it, because I missed their argument when it came to that. It just didn't really make sense to me personally, but. Gotcha. No, and it's a lot, you know, part of it and I'm not sure if, you know, you picked up, you probably picked up on this was, you know, they are, unseaworthiness and Jones Act negligence are kind of considered, they've been called Siamese twins. They're very similar, but they're distinct from each other. Unseaworthiness, you know, goes towards the vessel owner, whereas Jones Act negligence goes towards the seaman's employer. Now, you know, more often than not, they could, they, they're probably one and the same. But again, it's a cause of action against different persons who have different responsibilities under the law. So, that kind of cleared up? Yeah, that helped. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Um, do y'all have any other further questions? So, that's essentially, um, to kind of sum up Addison, that's essentially what the case held was that um, the Supreme Court, you know, acting as a federal court sitting in Admiralty shouldn't be creating novel remedies where, you know, Congress has kind of, limit, you know, already spoken, even though they may, may not have directly spoken on it. You know, it's a, it was a very contentious issue, but it's now been put to rest by the Supreme Court. So there was a lot of litigation about this prior to, prior to the decision. So it was a big one for, for the maritime world and for the maritime industry, you know, whether seamen could pursue one remedy or the other, or, you know, get punitives or not get punitives, you know, made a big, big difference in their claims. So um, any other questions on Batterton? I don't think so. Thank you for clearing that up for me. No worries. Um, Okay, so let's switch over to, I know Colin wanted us to cover a uh, final few pages um, from the textbook as well, and this will kind of lead into the Frascati case, the Supreme Court Frascati case. So who had uh, the Orduna? That was my case. Okay. 
This would be a pretty short one. Yeah. Um, okay. This case was about, it was on the Mississippi River, and um, there was an incident where a ship had a delay in um, departure because um, a loading arm fell on the elevator on the dock of the um, Trevisan. And um, so the ship owner of the Ordona, Ordona, Ordona um, sued um, the uh, voyage charters. Um, so they kind of talked about how. Um, so before getting into it, so who were the so who were the the three? I, who would I call the three big players in it? So who was the ship owner and who was the voyage charter? Um. The okay. So Euro was the vessel charter. Um, and then the ship owner was Or Ordana. Um, and then I think those are the big two. So yeah. other than the vessel itself, which always has kind of an importance in maritime law. Mm -hmm. Um, but okay, so what happened? in the district court? Um, the district court found um, Euro, which was the voyage charters, liable. Um, and, but they granted Euro full in, indemnification from other defendants. Um, let's see. And so what was, why was Orduna suing Euro? Um, if I understand correctly, they were suing them for liability of the, um, because they claimed Guess they were they were suing them for liability of the incident. And yes, they were. They were they, going. Um, because throughout they discussed how the ship owner necessarily was arguing that they weren't liable for the incident because um the charter had more control over it or something. I know. Because yes. the charter typically chooses, like they stated, chooses the ports and um, the routes of where the actual ship goes because that's not necessarily what the ship owners decide. So it's not, they shouldn't be liable for something that happens because of the location they go to with the ship. Yeah, so have y'all, so yeah, what what is, so what, first of all, actually, what is a voyage charter real quick? Just getting back to definitions. Um, that, okay, that one is, this one that the, they have the ship. So they charter the ship. I believe they pay for, they pay for the gas separately, right? Or is that included? So, or see an answer? They don't Sorry. have to pay for the gas. Uh, it's built into the fee right. for a voyage charter. Yeah. Um, yeah, Colin basically described it as like a taxi cab driver to the airport. Mm -hmm. So you're just paying for the trip itself. Um, and so you're just paying for, you know, that, that particular voyage. Um, and so, uh, 
you know, again, like the sinks between time charter versus a void charter versus, you know, there are other types of charters, a bare boat charter, um, you know, who's going to really take on responsibility of the vessel, you know, is very, very different. Um, and so here, you know, there was damage to the vessel, but this charter party between the two had this, this safe birth clause. Um, and now getting back to you. So um, what, why did um, Euro say, you know, it wasn't responsible under the voyage charter, under the safe birth clause for um, the damages to the vessel? Um, Euro argued that most of the clause imposed upon um, that, hold on. I think what it means is that Giro argues that they did take due diligence when they were deciding the route. Yeah, so what, what basically, and you know, for that safe birth clause, essentially what's happening is owners are saying that, you know, that that's an express warranty to us that, you know, where you send our vessel, where you designate that birth, that location, and, um, you know, no harm will come to our vessel. I mean, mm -hmm. in, you know, in, just in summary terms. Um, uh, but, you know, because that's kind of a harsh, you know, provision, I guess, on the time charter or the voyage charter, um, you know, they argued that, you know, as long as we took appropriate steps to designate that, you know, we can't be at fault for everything. And so then getting, you know, to what you mentioned earlier, the Fifth Circuit, um, under Judge Davis, um, who's a just, uh, he's a big authority in the Fifth Circuit and writing maritime opinions. Um, he, you know, said that, no, we agree, you know, a charter isn't, you know, essentially this safe birth clause is an express warranty um, to, you know, the ship owner. And what were the two reasons that he agreed with the, to, with the due diligence argument? Um, he talked about how that, I think this goes into the master argument, right? About how, um, that the master of the ship knows at the time what the best, um, safety route or the best route to take when it comes to safety. And they have more control over what is exact exactly would be due diligence because they're actually there and they actually see what's going on mm -hmm. um and then um okay and then i think they taught the second argument was um about how It's kind of confusing to me about, because they're kind of talking about how the master doesn't have to take um, a vessel into an unsafe berth, but. Yeah, so um, basically the clause kind of has, you know, it, it, it's a two-way street almost. Mm -hmm. So basically under the clause, if the master himself determines that the berth is, un, you know, it's an unsafe berth, he's not going to be penalized for refusing to, you know, basically follow charter's directions um, in that instance under the clause. Um, but what Judge Davis here also says is essentially that he thinks that inserting negligence um, into, you know, again, kind of due diligence standard into the clause um, doesn't basically create more problems than, it's, than it solves. Essentially by placing, you know, since the charter he believes is not in the best position um, to know what's going on the ground as opposed to the master who's, you know, under, under really the master, I mean, the master is an agent of the owner of the vessel, but, you know, serves at the direction of the, whether the, you know, the charter depending on the charter party, so. Um, 
So that second um, argument is kind of just saying, it's just kind of saying that there's not necessarily negligence here by the... It's saying that there has to be some, that in order to find um, that the charter breached the clause, mm -hmm. there does have to be some mm -hmm. sort of negligence, essentially. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. But, you know, as we'll see when we get to Frascati, one, um, you know, the Fifth Circuit rule and or do not is um, been overruled. And then, you know, the other circuits prior to it being overruled recently have disagreed. And for us, I think this gets into the Third Circuit opinion for Scotty. And then, you know, we'll just kind of build into the Supreme Court case. Yeah, if you don't, yeah, they'll just go ahead and some, kind of some facts. I know between the Supreme Court case, it's, it's quite a lot. So I just say, you know, just stick with the Third Circuit for right now. Um, so for Scotty, owned the Athos one and it was uh, in a tanker pool. Uh, it had been chartered into a tanker pool assembled by Star Tanker. And then it was uh, sub chartered to Car Carco mm -hmm. um, on a voyage charter. Um, Star Tanker had a time charter, but basically they were coming into a port um, that charter that a uh, Star Tanker and Carco had a uh, contract for, like they decided where the what port they would go to and coming into the port, there was a anchor uh, submerged underwater that the boat hit, caused a huge oil leak. And now they're trying to figure out if, uh, if they'd be liable for that, if uh, Carco is liable. Yeah, and so this kind of gets into a little bit more, but who, so why was, um, how is Frascati suing in this instance? Did you pick that up? He's suing as a third party beneficiary, mm -hmm. um, which they had to decide. And they basically said that this, he owns the boat. It'd kind of be weird not to allow him to be in the suit. Yeah. And do you remember what, what, what were the big damages that they were, you know, really concerned about here? Uh, probably cleaning up the oil. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is just, this is probably a little bit more information, but so, you know, when you read the Supreme Court opinion, really what's going on here is, you know, in the United States after the Exxon Valdez, there's this whole new oil cleanup regime um, called OPA 90. And essentially what ends up happening is, you know, a party will be designated a responsible party um, and here, you know, that was um, Frascati as the vessel owner under Open 90, um, who then ha is required by law to pay it for the cleanup costs. And then as long as, you know, they, in a good faith effort, clean up the oil, then they actually get reimbursed in part um, by what's called the, the fund. Um, it's an oil pollution, I think it's the Oil Pollution Trust Fund um, from the federal government. And so it's both actually for Scotty and the U.S. government through that trust fund trying to, you know, basically sue um, and recover from Carco um, the damages, basically all the cleanup costs that they paid, you know, pursuant to Open 90. So, um, all right. And so what, um, and so what did, uh, the Third Circuit think about the due diligence argument that Carco argued? argued. They pretty much dismissed it very quickly. Uh, they, they just didn't think that it held very much merit. And what were the, what were the specific reasons that they gave for, um, for, for rejecting it? I'm not 
not sure what type of uh, authority they were citing, but something titled voyage charters. They were talking about uh, a port is deemed safe where the particular charter vessel can proceed to, to it, use it, and depart from it without, in the absence of normal weather, or other occurrence being exposed to danger, which cannot be avoided by good navigation and seamanship. Mm, so that's that's kind of, um, you know, I guess getting to the plain language um, of the charter and then courts interpreting what essentially a safe port is. So a port is safe when a vessel, you know, can obviously get to the port, use so it. Do they use you know, the second circuit opinions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Third Circuit relied on Second Circuit authority um, for, for that opinion. Um, and so, based on that, why did they think that the Fifth Circuit due diligence argument didn't stand up to the Second Circuit's plain, you know, plain language interpretation? Uh, they just, I mean, I thought that they just saw it as inconsistent with other holdings. That's true. Um, essentially, I mean, they, they rejected the, they didn't think, um, and that, you know, in part, the Fifth Circuit had relied on scholars and commentators, you know, to admiralty law, you know, trying to evaluate who's in the best position essentially to, um, to take on this liability, this responsibility, um, or responsibility of liability for, you know, these accidents essentially designating, uh, the safe birth. Um, and so they didn't see, you know, again, you know, the court says, that the appeal of this construction is illusionary. And so I'm on page 332 um, of your text. Um, and so they thought that the Fifth Circuit's approach, basically that the master was in a better position, didn't really hold up. The, pat the master was in no better position than the charterer to decide whether the port was safe. What do you think about that? I think there's good arguments to both sides. I mean, if the chart, the charter is likely choosing a port that they're familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that gives a good argument and it's possible that the master may have never been to that port and has no idea. Very true. But what about the fact that the clause gives the master an out to, you know, basically say, I'm not going to go to this port because I think it's unsafe. I mean, does that not seem, you know, is it the fact that the clause is express and express warranty to the charterer, you know, they've never been, they've also never been to that part. I mean, yeah, they might be familiar with it, but they, you know, they might not know every single aspect of it, you know, such as an underground anchor um, based on surveys. I mean, is it fair to give the, the master of the vessel the on the ground decision to reject the port, but the time charter, you know, I mean, the time charter conceivably could reject the port, but I mean, they, they probably won't have any, any up-to-date information compared to the master. Well, I think they'd both kind of be at fault, especially with the facts like this anchor. They probably, neither of them would be able to see that coming. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was more in favor that it should be on the charter and why so? Um, just because I feel like that's putting too much on the master who might have never been to the port and yet the charters most likely had business with that port. Uh, gotcha. And again, that's... Um, it's a good point. I mean, 
you know, charters may or may not be familiar with it, but more often than not, you know, especially if they're on um, a liner service, you know, they're going to, you know, they've designated that ship to, you know, go to that port often. Um, and so turning to the Supreme Court's decision um, of it, did they most affirm the Third Circuit's opinion? I mean, what were what were the differences, if any? I felt like they mostly affirmed it. Um, they definitely dismissed uh, the Ordana, Ordana holding and overruled it. Um, yeah, I thought that they were mainly just agreeing with the Third Circuit. No, I think you're, I think you're right. I didn't really, you know, um, see a whole lot of, you know, independent rationale proposed by the, the, the Supreme Court that, you know, the Third Circuit already hadn't, you know, engaged in, in their own analysis um, in the court below. Um, but what did you think, um, about the, so they, do you think there's actually, the court has an interesting commentary on, um, I think this is page, it'd probably be page four of the PDF, um, where they're arguing against the dissent, essentially, and saying that there isn't any contention between the duty of the master and the duty of the charter under the safe birth clause. Do you pick up on that? Yeah, um, I I focus more on the uh, their contract to tort analysis for dismissing due diligence uh, more so than the dissent. Um, I mean, correct. Yeah, but, and again, this kind of raises that point of the master's duty to basically carry out charters instructions to load and unload, you know, discharge the, the, um, the cargo at a safe berth versus, um, you know, time charters duty to select one. Um, mm -hmm. and so, you know, going back again, you know, is it, you know, really who is in the best position? Is it, you know, fair to make this uniform pronouncement that, you know, well, yes, yeah, best on the plain language of the charter party, the, you know, the safe birth clause, you know, all charters now be on notice that, you know, you have to absolutely be 100% sure that that birth, that place you're designated to send the vessel must be safe. Um, do you think, I mean, what, what implications do you think that would have for charters or charter parties? Maybe they're going to hire a diving team to look for hidden anchors. <laughs> um, do you think they should? have to do that i mean if if they choose where you have to go then the burden's on them i mean they did talk about the freedom to contract and if if it was held the other way then it sounds like this is not really much of a warranty at all um That's so fair. i think that they should bear that burden Yeah, I mean, the, well, the, the Supreme Court definitely says so as well. Um, but I mean, you know, a lot of times what, you know, I mean, there are a whole different complex, you know, set of laws that also govern, you know, uh, you know, vessel, you know, wreck removal or, you know, people leaving <laughs> things in places where they shouldn't, you know, the port, you know, the ports themselves, you know, cleaning up, um, making sure that their, uh, you know, channels are navigable. I mean, a lot of that actually calls on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, you know, they're out here dredging in the Savannah River, you know, trying to deepen it to make it, you know, more available for larger ships, et cetera. And so it's really up to the Corps of Engineers to make, you know, to keep those channels open. So, I mean, how is a charter to know if, you know, during one of those operations, something goes wrong and then, you know, there's a, there's something down that they don't know about. But I mean, again, you know, I think it's a combination of actors that, that all have to play, but definitely the Supreme Court decision here definitely restores uniformity to to the maritime law. So, and is in line with 
the Miles opinion, which again um, says that, you know, the goal of federal maritime law is to create this uniformity, whether, you know, again, it's between states or, you know, when we're playing for, with international actors um, as well. It's part of the reason that the, you know, admiralty and maritime jurisdiction was awarded to federal courts rather than state courts for the most part and for certain actions. So, okay. Um, any questions about Frascati or the safe birth clause? Nope, okay. Um, so I think let's go ahead and tackle um, Uh, I think it was Lu Jung Hong versus Boeing. Yeah, that's me. Or is that you? Okay. So, so what's the setup? Hmm? What's the setup? What's the background? What's going on in the case? Um, so the Boeing, uh, which is an airplane. Uh, was coming in to land and it hit a seawall right before it landed and then 49 passengers sustained injuries, three died. Um, a lot of people filed suit over this uh, and there was an issue on whether it was, it could be um, Admiralty jurisdiction or um, there's also talk of uh, multi-district litigation. Yeah, let's not um, focus on that or too much. Okay. NPLs are, are a whole other beast in and of themselves, so. Yeah, I've been working on some of those yeah. for work and it's, it's a lot. Um, um, Okay, so procedurally, where where are we at in this case? Wait, what do you mean? Uh, like on remand? Um, yeah. So on a on a what are the basically? How did we get to the appellate court um, here? Uh, from a motion to remand. Yeah. Um, and did you pick up? Um, so did you pick up on anything about, you know, whether the court could consider the motion to remand? They were saying that they can uh, look at motions to remand, but after like a, the district court's order of like everything, not just the remand. It's true. So actually, um, the remand is little issues within it. Yeah, so this is, this is kind of a non Hamilton issue, but also a very important one, um, especially, you know, if y'all work in federal court, is you when a district court orders a remand, it's a non-reviewable order for the most part, except for in limited circumstances. Um, and so what's the circumstance here that gives the court the ability to, to review this remand order? Oh, man. Trying to find this case was so long. Uh, yeah, so I think it. To, yeah, this is not. I mean, it's an important issue, but not you know for maritime and admiralty jurisdiction in particular, but essentially what the court is focusing in on, on whether it can review the remand order is there's a special statutory grant under um, Yeah. So the acting under um, whether Boeing is a federal officer um, mm -hmm. and they're acting under the FAA. Um, and so if, and you'll see this sometimes, especially with larger companies, um, you know, when they, when they can get that, you know, acting under as a, basically be, to be designated as a federal officer, in those instances, because of the explicit statutory grant of review to the appellate court, they can, you know, review the remand order, um, essentially. And so that's how they then 
get to the second big issue that is actually more focused for this class, which is, um, well, it's the second issue. Uh, if there's admiralty jurisdiction. Yeah. And so why, why don't they believe there is, um, well, I'm sorry, there are actually three issues. So why is the court getting to whether there's admiralty jurisdiction or not? Why does the court say there is admiralty jurisdiction? Uh, because it could have been filed in federal court. Um, so that that kind of gets to to one of the other. But well, well, yes. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. Expand on that thought. Uh, I know that they were talking about how this was not a flight like only within the U.S. It was a flight overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that's more of a maritime activity than a than flying like from one state to another yeah so essentially that goes back to can if you remember the the case name um executive essentially jet. goes back to executive jet yeah to determine you know whether the stat the, the situs and the nexus requirements are met for admiralty tort jurisdiction. Um, again, what we'll be talking about here, if we if we have enough time in Barrios' admiralty jurisdiction for maritime contracts, which is different. Uh, but yeah, so applying the, you know, the, uh, so in applying the, you know, executive debt situs and nexus tests, essentially, you know, as you said, you know, there was no, you know, this wasn't a domestic flight just over, you know, U.S. land. This was going to be a flight over navigable waters. Um, and that, you know, a jet crashing into navigable waters could have an impact on maritime commerce. Um, but the real kind of the reason I think uh, Colin chose this case was the fact the removal of, you know, removal into federal court aside from the federal officer stuff. And what was, what was that issue about? trying to remember so it's kind of intertwined between the removal aspect and then the admiralty jurisdiction aspect i think you kind of said it earlier on because the federal court had admiralty jurisdiction under 1333 mm -hmm. i think i got confused now Okay, so um, essentially, um, you know, a court can't review the remand order, which kind of, which again, makes this opinion a little bit more special than other opinions since, you know, there aren't a lot of removals. So what was, so Boeing argued that they could remove to federal court because they had admiralty jurisdiction, right? Mm -hmm. And so do y'all, do you remember what's special about the 1333 clause that allows, gives federal courts admiralty jurisdiction? There's a special phrase in there. Um, I might have missed it. So in admiralty, in 1333, um, there is a special clause called the saving to suitors clause, um, which gives state courts essentially not directly, but indirectly, it gives plaintiffs the ability to choose. Yeah. They can choose to proceed in state courts for their maritime claims in many instances, not all, but most, or they can proceed in federal court. Um, and you know, the derivatives, whether you choose state court or federal court are, are different. Um, so if like, for instance, I don't know if you'll talk about it, you can pursue an in-rim claim in federal court, you know, against a vessel or against maritime property, whereas you can't do that in state court. Um, but getting back to that saving the suitors clause, um, why do you think that would, do you think that prevents removal into federal court?
is so if plaintiff chooses to bring their case in state court, should and Congress specifically reserved to plaintiffs the ability to bring their case in state court if they wanted to. So they have the ability to choose their forum. Um, do you think the ability of a defendant to remove it into federal court based on you know the federal court's ability to have admiralty jurisdiction as well should you know can they do that i mean maybe i had a different understanding when i'm like prior to this case on how stuff like that worked i thought that the defendant could remove if they had if they established uh Admiralty jurisdiction. So they actually, so no, it, it, well, depending, so you can't, so the issue here is, so, I mean, like most things, it's a qualified, um, the, under the savings to suitor clause, most courts have held that you cannot remove a case in the Admiralty. So for instance, how other maritime cases get removed is, for instance, if I have a Longshoreman case, um, and there's diversity jurisdiction, the defendant removes into the court's diversity jurisdiction, not its admiralty jurisdiction, even though the claims are admiralty based and could give rise to admiralty jurisdiction. Um, and same with federal question. I mean, there's a, there's a bit of a distinction. So, um, general maritime law isn't considered a federal federal question um, in a lot of instances, not all. Again, this is a big qualified asterisk, you know, go look it up um, depending on the claim and what's going on. But, you know, a lot of, since a lot of claims aren't, maritime claims aren't also federal question claims, if there's no diversity and no um, federal question and the admiralty jurisdictional statute has the state to suitor clause, can, can a defendant try to defeat the plaintiff's choice of forum, even though Congress put in that clause? Uh, I guess no. It, yeah, that's right. Um, and so there's a prohibition against it when it's just in Admiralty. But what was odd about you know, the Boeing case is that one, they reviewed the remand order, but two, that they, Boeing said we could remove it into federal court because you have admiralty jurisdiction, despite the savings to suitor clause. And so this case is a little bit, as you pointed out, it's a little bit complex, but the reason they said they were able to do so is Congress in another removal statute under 1442 and you know uh, 1443. I'm sorry, they, well there there are multiple, um, but uh, basically modified language in the removal where courts had previously relied on that language to say no, you can't remove the case in Admiralty. It's just still an absolute bar, you know, in addition to the savings to suitor clause. Um, but with the modification of that text, the Seventh Circuit said, well, we no longer, there's no longer a bar on removing it. And so that's, that's the big issue here. Um, and again, it gets into a lot of what did Congress intend by clarifying, you know, these particular, uh, you know, statutes uh, at issue, um, you know, did Congress by modifying the language actually intend to allow Admiralty claims to be removed um, despite the savings to suitor clause? I mean, did they just kind of, you know, drop the ball on that despite their previous, uh, you know, 1331 language? Um, and so that's really, really the big, the crux of, of the Boeing case because every court, nearly every court, there are a few, there are a few district courts out there that have, that have agreed with the Seventh Circuit's holding and said, no, we can now remove, you can now remove cases into Admiralty despite the saving to suitors clause. Um, and so that's, 
you know, again, because of the limited review of remand, it's going to be hard for another appellate court to really pick up that issue and kind of decide it. But, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, um, but I hope that kind of clears, clears what's going on up for y'all. Um, yeah. What's going on in that case, yeah. Um, do y'all have any, so backing up a little bit, more general questions about, do y'all have questions about removal um, or, you know, faculty jurisdiction or federal question diversity and, and how those claims get removed or I think we kind of covered it pretty well earlier. Yeah, I think I get it now. Okay. So if I brought a, say I brought a longshoreman action under 905B, it's a negligence type action um, under the maritime law. Could a, when, under what circumstances would a federal court be able to hear that claim if you brought it in state court originally? Using the savings to suitors clause? So, so let's say he's sued in state court, but the defendant wants to remove to federal court. When could the federal court receive the case? By remanding it? I mean, removing it? Yeah, and, but what would be the jurisdictional basis for the removal? Would it be under the admiralty jurisdiction, diversity jurisdiction, or federal question? Admiralty. So under Boeing, yes, you could remove it. Um, but every other circuit court, um, including the 11th circuit, has said you can't. And so you'd have to remove it under diversity jurisdiction in that instance. So um, essentially the rule of thumb in, in for maritime claims is if the plaintiff brings their case in state court, you can't remove it unless you have diversity jurisdiction, essentially. It's that, that's the general rule and Boeing is the exception to that rule. And so only in the Seventh Circuit can you remove a case under the Admiralty Jurisdiction Statute, despite the Savings to Suitors Clause. I thought earlier you said uh, that it was only district courts that it gone against uh Boeing sorry so I'm sorry well you're you're right so only well circuit other circuit courts have previously held prior to Boeing that this new statutory language didn't change anything no court has addressed post Boeing no appellate court has addressed post Boeing the new language that the Seventh Circuit relied on to allow the removal of the faculty. But some district courts have elsewhere. Did they not file uh, to the Supreme Court? No, they, well, I'm actually not sure. I'd have to go back and look at the case history. Um, I don't think so um, off the top of my head, but I'm, and I'm, you know, if they didn't, you know, again, the Supreme Court's always, you know, a hit or miss. You, the chances of you actually getting a uh, cert granted are pretty, pretty rare. But doesn't that create a discrepancy now in the goal of uniformity? It does, however, because again, going back to the fact that um, the other circuit courts, like, you know, the big maritime circuits are the Ninth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit, the Eleventh, the Second, um, because they all haven't addressed it post post the Seventh Circuit decision, there really, there really isn't technically a split yet because the courts haven't interpreted that statutory language the Seventh Circuit did under 1442 and 1443 yet that they relied on to decide that you could now remove an admiralty. They've only, you know, previously decided, you know, they've used those statutes to say that you can't, but they've also relied on the savings to suitor clause in general. Do you think the other um, circuits will later on talk about it or do you think it'll just kind of 
Well, that's actually kind of, that's a funny question because the Fifth Circuit recently, uh, well, I say recently, but two or three years ago, they actually had put a comment in an opinion basically saying that, yeah, we recognize that this is an issue, but we're declining to address it now because we don't think it's right. Um, and so they had the opportunity, but they declined to do so. And again, the reviewability of a remand order is, is so limited, um, you know, really what it would come down to is the way you'd have to set up the case is the plaintiff remove, you know, I'm sorry, plaintiff files in state court, defendant removes into federal court under admiralty jurisdiction under 1333. And then the court would have to deny the remand order in order to then make it appealable. So you can appeal a denial of a remand order, you can't appeal um, a grant of a remand order. So. so you can appeal a denial, but not a grant, right? Correct. Okay. And more often than not, you know, because federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction, you know, when the, you know, when they think they should remand it, they're going to remand it. So, um, you know, and whether, I mean, I think it's definitely going to be a hot button issue here. I mean, a lot of, a lot of district courts holding on to old precedent have kind of, you know, said we're not, we're not even entertaining the Seventh Circuit's reasoning or their argument. And so, you know, whether those get appealed up because district courts don't follow the Second Circuit, most district courts don't follow the Second Circuit's reasoning, they remand the cases back to state court, but you can't appeal those orders. So that's why it's kind of, you know, the rights, you know, you re it really has to get into the right situation on, you know, when, if and when you can actually appeal that particular issue, so. All right, um, so I think we've got Barrio, so I don't wanna keep you all too long. I know you've got that practice exam um, here in a few minutes. Um, so what I'll just kind of do is, is run through, um, have y'all done maritime contracts? Like what the test for maritime contract is? Yep. Mark, can you kind of talk, tell me generally? A while ago. Okay. Trying to find it. Is that the second class maybe? And so really the, the nature of the subject matter mm, it has to do with you know what the contract primarily deals with and it, it was a big case um involving a bill of lading with the railroad you know um portion to the transportation in addition to the waterborne portion of the transportation um which is kirby um is the name of the case um and so really just to kind of um, summarize the case uh, for y'all. Really what the issues were in Barrios were whether the, you know, a lot of times, a lot of contracts, especially um, if you're working offshore, um, like in the coastal, coastal regions, um, contracts will be mixed. You know, it might be working, you know, repairing a dock or, you know, some, or, you know, facility that borders the water in which, you know, a vessel might be involved for portions of the work and, you know, uh, a lot of, but a lot of it's still going to be land-based construction, et cetera, or whether you're talking about transporting goods, you know, whether it's from Sydney all the way up to Athens, where the only portion that's going to be, you know, on land is going to be from Savannah up to Atlanta. Um, and whether that's a maritime contract or not uh, is really the issue for, a lot of these cases. Um, a lot of times courts like to say, is you know, the contract salty enough, um, essentially, uh, determine whether it's a maritime contract or not. Um, and so Elle, do you wanna set up just the parties 
uh, for us in Barrios? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, so this was the one I talked about earlier, but um, a marine construction company alleged that, or an employee alleged that he was injured while transferring the generator from a crew boat to a barge. Um, and he brought a personal injury case against the employer who I believe was, was it Centara? I think. Mm -hmm. Centara. Um, yeah. And um, the owner and operator of the boat, um, he stated that um, there was negligence under just general maritime law. And also he did a claim under the Jones Act. Um, so the district court um, did a summary judgment motion um, for the owner's cross claim. Um, and then the boat owner filed an interlocutory appeal. Um, and then the employer, which was Centara, moved to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. Um, yeah, so they yeah. kind of broke, sorry. Yeah, no, and so how did, uh, so what was, yeah, you kind of got it earlier, but so did, how did a maritime contract come into play here? Um, they were talking about how, hold on. Bring up my notes. So, um, the employee was, uh, he was offloading a generator from a crew boat. So it was, um, I guess the owner, um, okay. So they were doing a dock construction project, sorry. Yeah, and um, the, um, so I guess the um, contract was between River Ventures, right, and Centara? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. And so essentially what was happening here was River Ventures filed a cross claim, as you said earlier, a cross claim against Centaur for um, contractual indemnity, you know, for, you know, anything they might have to pay the, um, the injured worker. Um, and the, the big issue is, well, in this dealt well, specifically with Louisiana, uh, mm -hmm. is they have an anti-indemnity statute and, for contracts like this. Um, and so whether the contract fell under Louisiana state law or under federal maritime law was really, you know, the, the, the primary issue because if it was under federal maritime law, then that indemnity portion um, and that cross claim could go forward by River Ventures against Centaur um, uh, versus if it fell in Louisiana law, it would be again, it'd be void against public policy in that particular, in, in that instance. And so really the, the big reason the Barrios case is, you know, and very important for, I mean, Again, it's, it's in the Fifth Circuit, so you know it has limited presidential value mm -hmm. outside of that circuit. But in general, is because the the Fifth Circuit essentially came up with a new test for when a mixed contract is maritime or not, based on the Supreme Court's decision in Kirby. And essentially, what they said there is, you know, even though their new test uh, originally was made for mixed oil and gas contracts, they thought it could apply to you know all types of mixed contracts, you know, whether it was something like this, where, you know, you have construction products going on, um, or bills of lading, um, transportation of goods, etc. And so essentially, what the Fifth Circuit ended up saying was that whether a contract was maritime or not was whether it was to provide services to facilitate activities on maritime on navigable waters, and then whether the contract to um, or the party's expectations um, that a vessel, whether the contract provides for a vessel to play a part in, you know, the activity, 
or whether the parties expect that a vessel will play a substantial role. Um, and so it's a easy two factor test rather than a previous kind of Byzantine six factor test that had been previously used by the Fifth Circuit and kind of adopted by um, some other circuits. Um, but I guess after reading reading the case and reading, really, I guess my question for you is um, whether do you think it's fair if a party, let's say a vessel becomes involved in, you know, a construction project, mm -hmm. but the part, and it plays a, sub, a substantial role and the activity is, you know, a maritime one. Um, do you think it's still fair to call that a maritime contract, even if the parties hadn't expected the vessel to play a part at all? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think, Personally, what I think is that although you don't expect it to happen, there's still that possibility of it happening. And I think you should be prepared for that possibility because it is a vessel and typically that, I mean, it's used for maritime, but. Um, yeah, or there's, you know, there's an interest. Um, yeah. In uniformity in maritime contracts when, you know, maritime commerce is involved in you know, maritime vessels or actual vessels are involved. Um, and so did you pick up on what the Fifth Circuit said? Do you think that might be a general rule for, for something like that? Whether, you know, the expectation of the parties? Um, okay. They stated, can I read what they stated? Yeah. So I think it kind of, um, well, they kind of talk about Crescent. They say, we must remember that the contract and party's expectations are central. Um, so when work, di work is performed in part on a vessel and part on a platform or on land, we should consider not only time spent on the vessel, but also the relative importance and value of the vessel-based vessel work. Um, and they then go on to say, even significant vessel involvement isn't enough if the, bob if the involvement was unexpected. So I guess they kind of argue that um, even if it's like sick, significant involvement, that it doesn't matter that if you don't expect it, then. Yeah, I think the, no, that's exactly right. Um... And I think that one of the big footnotes they put in there is, and I'm, I'm not sure you all already remember this under um, Jones Act cases, but I think it's under footnotes. Sorry. Under the footnote talking about Chandris um, and the 30% rule, it's fifth, it's a, uh, so it's footnote 15, but I think they make the comment on page, um, the very, it's the second to last page. So um, at the top, when work is performed, you know, in part on a vessel, part of the easier saying other the relative importance um, and that 30% rule, I think is the, is the new one to go by. So I think that's, they usually would only apply that to, you know, whether Jones Act Seaman was, you know, in fact, uh, as you know, whether his work was actually, you know, in further into the vessel and whether he had a connection, you know, the amount of time and work he put on a vessel versus his land-based activities would determine whether he's a seaman. But here you kind of have a new 30% rule for whether, you know, this is a maritime contract based on the involvement of a vessel. So is the vessel's, you know, involvement more or less than 30%, so. I have a question, what, which they might have said, but I missed it. Why did they choose to do 30% as the? So that goes back to the, the Chandra's case. So they, they said 30% okay. based off the fact that they had kind of used that rule of thumb for whether a worker was a Jones Act worker, you know, Jones Act seaman, based mm -hmm. on the amount of time he spent on a vessel okay. for his work. Um, and, you know, courts, are, that's a very factual based question on, you know, whether they meet that 30% or not. And so I think here in Barrios, they felt that was, you know, again, there's no absolute rule of thumb, but they mm -hmm. felt like that was a good one for whether determining, you know, 
seaman status as it would, would be for, you know, maritime contract and vessel, you know, a vessel playing a part in a maritime contract in determining the if maritime fortune. If it's over 30%, then yeah. it is? Yeah, if it's over 30, if a vessel plays more than a 30% role, um, you know, in the activities um, or in the contract, then it would be a maritime contract here okay. under the Fifth Circuit's new rule. So, but again, that's a, it could go either way. So it doesn't have to be exactly 30%. It could be 29, maybe 28, depending on the exact nature, but that's the 30% rule is the, is the general, general guideline. So, all right. Well, um, thank you all. It was a pleasure. Do y'all have any other questions? Um, about any anything we covered tonight or um, in general, I guess. I don't think so. Okay. Thank you for teaching us. Yeah, no worries. Um, hopefully, y'all caught up on some recent, more recent maritime opinion versus reading ones from the 1800s and the early 20th century. So. <laughs> Sorry if we were uh, a little rough on case briefing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, these were these were extremely um you know they're complex issues and very long opinions you know I, to be fair you know i think if you know we'll try to cut them down essentially to the more relevant portions as the case book does um because i know i know it's hard to you know sift through an entire opinion when you're just really looking you know for that one one or two points of law so um no worries y'all y'all did an excellent job so Thank you. It was hard not having our school printer to print everything out because I was like scrolling and. Oh yeah. No. <laughs> I understand. How are y'all doing with the uh, with the whole like? Are y'all going back to school this fall? Um, I think yeah. so. I think they said we were, but they're going to give us all face mask and hand sanitizer. <laughs> so hopefully we go yeah. back. Cause, yeah. <laughs> I hope we go back. I couldn't couldn't imagine having to to deal with to go to school with all that going on. I mean, it's already tough enough. So, mm -hmm. but well, anyway, um, hopefully, Colin, do y'all have the testing materials that for y'all to work on, or did he not uh, email that to us? Or okay, uh, I think so. Or maybe he posted. I think y'all y'all use Canvas. Is that oh, what it? Did he post? Well? Yeah, maybe he. Okay. Well, um, I'll follow up with them about it. Um, just let you know, or I just shoot him an email, or you can shoot me an email as well. I think I'm CC'd on one of them. If you if you can't find it, and we'll see if we can we can get it to you. But you know, I'd say just spend you know some time working through the exam, um, making sure you you know understand all because a lot of a lot of what we kind of discussed tonight with some of the cases, you know, really kind of build upon that you know foundation. You know, are these navigable waters? Um, you know, is this person a seaman? Is this a maritime contract, et cetera? And so those are really, I think, you know, whenever you get to the final exam, um, what Colin's probably just been looking for is just kind of those those basic principles on, on you know, what is and, you know, what, you know, where stuff falls essentially and kind of what are these, some of these basic tests, so. But all right, okay, well, you all have a good evening. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.